Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 85 of Buds and Blue Jays, your one-stop shop for all things related to the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm your host, Jesse Burrell, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Riley McConnell. Riley, what's up, man? How are you? I am good, Jesse. I am good. Everything is good in baseball world. Got a lot of spring training. Got some World Baseball Classics. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm getting my fix in. Finally getting some good ball and lots of it. Excellent. Ready to go. It's going to be a fun season this year for the Toronto Blue Jays. Today on our episode, we are diving deep into the X factors for the Toronto Blue Jays. We are going to go over whose players performance are really going to turn this team into a division winner or perhaps a World Series winner or what could go wrong essentially for this Toronto Blue Jays team to really have us like disappoint in the standings. So we have that coming up. We have a lot of names for you, a lot of good discussion coming up. Plus, Team Canada is playing in the World Baseball Classic. We have some Toronto Blue Jays who are playing in the World Baseball Classic. So we've got a whole bunch of that plus some news and notes and more but first guys remember our show is free and we're available on all platforms so if you're watching us on youtube please like the video guys and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already we are rapidly growing and we want to see that number keep increasing if you're watching us or listening to us out in podcast land please five-star review hit those downloads hit those shares all that good stuff it really is the best way to help the show grow but riley with that being said there's so much going on in the baseball world right now spring training is in full swing we have people playing internationally on the world baseball classic and let's just dive right into it riley you wanted to pay it bring us attention here to um a puerto rican venezuelan game that happened the other night and how it affects the toronto blue jays so start there Oh, huge implications, Jesse. You want to talk about what to expect from the Blue Jays this year? I mean, you should have, uh, if you didn't watch this game, I honestly, I don't feel bad for you because if, if as a Blue Jays fan, you did not really want to see what was going on. And that was, of course, under the spotlight again, Jose Barrios um, shot for five runs in in an inning of work against Venezuela, pitching for Puerto Rico. Man, not what you want to see out of a guy who, to me, is a definite X factor for this Blue Jays team. When he's on, he can be extremely on. Now, we've talked about him a lot on this show. There Mm -hmm. are a lot of negatives and have been a lot of negatives with this guy. And it proved in that World Baseball Classic game. He's been given up a ton of hard contact and Anthony Santander took him deep for a three run home run. That's going to affect your line in some, some way, shape or form. And I think Altuve got a double off him. So yeah, you're giving up uh, extra base hits to some pretty good ball players, Jesse, but guess what? Those are guys that are, one of them's in our division. The other yep. guy is on playing on a superpower team in the American league. These are competitors that are playing against Jose Brees. Doesn't matter on what level, especially on that level. It, it concerns me quite a bit, but Jesse, my first X factor, I mean, spoiler alert, Jose Barrios, because in my heart, deep down, dude, I believe that this guy is an incredible arm. His numbers in the past really do back it up. But there are definitely adjustments that need to be made in his game. And one of them is going to be pitch location and yep. him missing over the heart of the plate for for hard contact, man. I really think he needs to dip and dive the ball down in the zone a little bit more, try to limit base runners in a way, and, and just be on more. Because, I mean, walking guys isn't going to do you any good either. But neither's given up a three-run home run and a double. I mean, there's going to have to be something made along the lines at some point. Something's got to give Jesse because we have this guy locked down long term and we cannot afford I know we finished with miraculous miraculously finished with a positive wins loss record last year but with an ERA above uh 2.5 in a whip the highest it's seen since his first eight career starts uh mm-hmm. 1.4 yeah. or something not what we would expect out of jose barrios but man i tell you when this guy is good he can be lights out he had a 14 game or a 14 strikeout game last yeah, year two of them and two, 14 he, strikeout games. two 14 strikeout games and that's the jose barrios we all want to see man that's why we paid the price um austin martin and simeon woods richard who are going to have lavish careers at the major league level at some point. But honestly, we got to get more from Jose Barrios. And I think that, yeah, we're going to get some blowups, but we're going to we're going to split it more down the middle on the positive side with him, because I truly believe there is a good pitcher in there. And if he can, you know, not get his fastball crushed and locate his off speed a little bit better and get a better pitch mix. I know that the hitters are recognizing, obviously recognizing that Jose Brios is missing with his pitches because he's got to get back on. He's a very important piece of this team, Jesse. 
Yeah, this start was incredibly disappointing too for Jose Brios because we've talked a few episodes ago about what like Jose Brios is trying to do in order to fix the problems he had. He was one of the first Toronto Blue Jays to report to camp too. So he seemed dedicated and determined to go out and try to fix this. And this was his first level of real like spring training games against the Pirates are great and all, but this was his first level against high level competition where he's actively trying to get the guys out. And Riley, it's the same issues we had last year, as you mentioned it. It's the control just wasn't there. I think he threw 11 slurves or his slurves curveball pitch. I don't think he threw a single one in the zone. He might've got a few swinging strikes on it, but that was it. And then we talked about his fastball, Riley. We wanted to see improved fastball command and I can pull up his pitch chart. He maybe had one on the bottom corner, one on the edge on the outside, but the rest were either high above the zone, way inside or right down the middle of the plate. And like, sure, the home run he gave up to, to Santander was a good pitch. It was down in the zone. But if you can't throw strikes with the other pitches, it's not going to matter. A guy can take that pitch and a guy can hit it out. And this is incredibly disappointing for Jose Barrios because if he, we get the guy who came over in the second half after the trade deadline last year, the Blue Jays are going to be a much better team. We're going to feel more comfortable in our pitching. And Honestly, dude, like I know you mentioned like the good Jose Brios is there somewhere, right? But I've seen no signs going back to mostly of last season and then going through what he's done so far this spring to think that we have really any confidence in Jose Brios is going to go back to that guy. And Riley, I'm, I for one, I'm nervous. I'm scared for when Jose Brios is going to pitch this year. I think if we compare his stats, Jesse, to last season, I mean, I know he got away with a positive wins loss record, but this is a guy who very well could, if he's very bad a lot, he could lose us 12 or 13 games. Which Easily. If you look yeah. at that down the stretch on a season, 12 or 13 games is a significant amount. I mean, hey, if Gosman and Manoa could tow the rubber every day back to back, that would be a perfect world. But we got five guys that are going to be throwing for us, and Jose Barrios is going to be one of them. What we're going to, we, we basically have to, you know, push is going to come to shove here and something's got to give. I mean, because we can't have him uh, being pulled, um, you know, even let alone in the first inning, just mm -hmm. after the first inning or whatever. Like a quality start consists of five good innings pitched. And I mean, it's a rarity to see that. And when we do see that, it comes out of absolutely nowhere. I mean, he's di I mean, he he'll be dynamite the next day. Seven seven innings pitched, double digit strikeouts, and you think, what? Like, why was this guy so bad in his previous start? And then all of a sudden, well, it happens again. J Jesse Jose Brios is is a crucial part to this rotation in the fact that I mean, he's an X factor on the sole fact that I think it pretty much decides if we're a, a 90 win team mm -hmm. or a 96 win team, because he is going to decide a lot of games for us. He might decide the division in that aspect for us. I mean, that makes sense, right? His career high in war is 4.4. .4, so you think if Jose Brios can go back to being the guy he was, that's what four or five wins added. And if he's a negative war player, which, you know, is unlikely, but not impossible, right? Then that could really shrink. And it is the difference really, especially because the Blue Jays biggest weakness here is probably our lack of pitching depth. Behind Yusei Kikuchi, we have like Mitch White, who's not completely healthy right now. And Ricky Tiedemann, who you and I will talk about him a little bit later, but we both don't think he's quite ready yet to join the big league club. So like, what are you going to do if Jose Brios is ineffective? Like, is Zach Thompson going to be starting for this team? He's not the type of player that's going to push this Toronto Blue Jays to an AL East championship. If he is, at least, I'll be very surprised. And we're not going to have a Ross Stripling type come in, take the roster, and help carry this team on his back every year. So, yeah, I'm worried. There is a little bit of a saving grace, though, Riley. If you do look under the hood, right, his XFIP, for example, was only 4.2, which is about equivalent what it was in 2019 and 2018. So there is a chance. The defense behind Barrios wasn't that good. You know, the Babbitt was 328. It was 277 the year before that. So if that normalizes, that could be good. But it's just a lot of the other stuff. Pitch location, he's giving up too much hard contact. It's just stuff that you think he should be able to control. And if he can control that, then he's going to be good. But I think, as we mentioned earlier, I'm nervous, and I think you are too. He's going to decide a lot of games for us, man. There's no question. Just looked at his FIP for last year, 4.55. Yep. So, I mean, not the best number you could ever think of. Certainly, I mean, with the year he had last year, who would who would have thought it would actually be, you know, sub 4.8? I mean, because it did seem at that. As he obviously finished with a plus 5 earned run average. But we're not here you know, to really crap on Jose Barrios because I'm really rooting for the guy. I know a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have True. even yeah. lost faith in him.
him. But I really think, like you said, under the hood, there's a very good pitcher, Jesse. And um, I mean, yes, he's going to have blow ups. There's no question about it. But the X factor in him is that he's going to decide a lot of games for us. And in, in there, there are for sure things in this rotation at the top of it. He can he can be very good and win us ball games or lose us quite a few down the stretch if he's not very good. He is the probably single individual like storyline that we're going to watch first because if Brios is good, the Blue Jays are going to be good. If he is not good, this Blue Jays team might struggle. It's going to be very, very interesting. Riley, if I put the over-under on Jose Brios at a 4.35 ERA, are you going higher or lower than that? I'm going to actually, I'm going to go, it's right around the line, but if I'm, I'm going to say it's going to be over, but I'm thinking like four, six, four, seven, I mean, okay. which is not good at a Jose Barrios, yeah, but that's again, still disappointing, it's, isn't it? Yeah, of course yeah. it is. But a lot of it is going to be the extra base hits that are allowed against him. I mean, I don't think he gives up as many hits and home runs as he did last year. I think he might even have surrendered. I don't know if it was 199 or 200 hits he surrendered. It was 172 innings pitched for him. I know that. That'll really cramp your numbers. And his strikeouts were down and his walks were up. But hey, and I said this, and I stick by this, Jesse, that it's it's not going to be as bad as it was last year. Looking at a baseball card point of view, like there's there's – there's no statistical way the baseball gods will not allow it. I say that he finished with, with around a 4.65 ERA. 4.6 would be nice, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see, man. 199 hits against and an even 100 earned runs against him, both highest in the American League for Jose Brio. So I guess the only way to go, but up, right? Let's hope it happens. Riley? On from, moving on from Jose Brios to another guy who's going to be in our rotation, who there has actually been some positivity coming out this spring. And that is my guy, Riley, Yusei Kikuchi. And this is, okay, I want to say two things about Yusei Kikuchi. One, if you look at the overall stat line, it looks pretty good. He's got seven no-hit innings this spring. His pitch mix looks different. You know, the results are there. He's looking good. But if you really look under the hood of Yusei Kikuchi, are you really seeing a different pitcher here? Because... His most recent spring outing, you know, he did walk a few guys and the defense wasn't great behind him, sure. But, you know, he's he's been kind of throwing different pitches in there too. And the big thing with Kikuchi I've noticed is that he's been throwing his slider more early for strikes. So his fastball, Riley, got hit incredibly hard last year, right? And it's weird for a guy who throws like 95, 96 on the left side, but he couldn't locate it. It was getting hit very hard. So he started throwing his like slurvy slider pitch and he is actually able to control that pitch more. So he's able to like flip it in there for a get me over strike one or use it for a get me over strike two. And I've also noticed Riley that his changeup usage is up a lot this spring, which is a good pitch. If you look up the metrics on it, hitters only hit 116 against the changeup last year and had over a 40% uh, whiff percentage on it. So I guess it just makes sense. It's the Ross Stripling thing, right? Ross Stripling's changeup was the best pitch he had, so he just started throwing his changeup more. It makes so much sense. And now it's good that we're finally going to be able to see that with Yusei Kikuchi. And plus, it lets him use the fastball now as kind of a just a change of pace pitch, you know, just kind of get the hitter thinking of something else. So as long as his control is there and maybe he goes back to a career normal of walk rate instead of the five per nine that he had last year, Yusei Kikuchi could be a very good pitcher for this team. I believe that um, Kikuchi this year is going to not, you know, depend on a lot of his lateral moving pitches, thus being a cutter or a slider, but in fact, be something like, you know, the down and dipping pitches being a change up low in the zone compared to a fastball that's going to get you, you know, behind compared to a change up um, getting out front. It's a good pitch mix if you can master it well. Been very impressed with Yusei Kikuchi's pitching this far in spring. I mean, last year, obviously, very disappointed in, in, in the numbers he put up in his appearances. And it sucked that he had to go to the bullpen there because you mm -hmm. don't want that with a guy like you say, Kikuchi. He's an extremely rare breed of player, Jesse. Like you said, a lefty that throws, uh, you know, hard. Is um is is few and far between, and you know control was an issue though. And I mean, yes. I guess you can't have your cake and eat it too. Maybe we'll call it, you know, the kind of the 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 first year slump with a new team. I don't know what it is. I I, I again predict good things for Kikuchi this year. I do think that he saddles in and gets adjusted into the rotation. Um, it's kind of the same thing with um with Jose Barrios though. This guy is an X factor on the fact that he's going to decide a lot of games for if he makes his scheduled start like all the other guys and goes every fifth game. I mean that's going to decide a lot if he goes from his his five spot in the rotation and starts 32 games for us. Mm -hmm. Those are 32 decisions that are need to be made, and there are guys who have pitched 32. Um, starts and won 20 games. We call them 20 game winners. And it's, a lot of them are in the 
Hall of Fame having great careers. You don't see a lot of guys in the Baseball Hall of Fame or All-Stars that have 15 plus losses now some of those you know can be based off you know the offense didn't give you whatever this toronto offense is going to give you a lot of run support yes so it yes, won't it be that I, I think you say like you say kikuchi in the five spot i'm not going to say has to do the bare minimum but he's got to put in a good amount of work for this to work and if he starts to slide by the fifth or sixth inning a little bit, and he's already had a good start. This is the guy that you take right out of a ball game. This yeah. is the guy that you don't want to leave in the ball game when he gets into trouble. I mean, you say Kikuchi in games and has been very good early on. And obviously, yeah, he could have gone longer, Jesse, but it's spring training. We're going to mix up other arms. But let's do the hypothetics for a second and say that this was a regular season game. Uh, you know, we'll leave him in, see how he goes. He starts to run into trouble in the fourth fourth inning, maybe has gotten two outs, but two runners on base via base on balls. I think that's, a, you know, we can possibly bring in another guy. If we're not up by four, five, or four or five runs at that point, I the leash is short. The leash, leash was short last year, but you've got to yeah. start out with a short leash this year as well, man, because we cannot be having huge blowups at this point. We know these games are very important. The fact that we, you know, play these divisional games a few times because we're playing every team in the league this year, you mm -hmm. know, those games are going to be important. If he starts one of those games specifically and starts to get hit around, maybe even the second time through the order. We got to make a change on the mound, change of speed, a change of pace, maybe a different hand of pitcher and, and start fresh and hope that we have, you know, uh, the guy come in, get a ground ball, double play, a strikeout, something, you know, to get the lads fired up and, you know, roll over and get on the bats. But I think you say Kikuchi has so much potential, Jesse. I'm definitely on your train as far as that goes. And I think he can be very, very good, but I would really love to see the consistency. Yeah, and I think you say Kikuchi is the perfect mold of pitcher to go exactly two times through the order, right? Because once, you, you know, hitters start to see him a third time, he can be very hittable. But if anything, John Schneider is going to want to get you say Kikuchi's like confidence up, right? Like if he's cruising, like this spring has got to do wonders for you say Kikuchi because he's got to be feeling good about himself finally. He finally feels like he's in a good spot, right? And plus going back to Barrios too, like, if these guys are our fourth and fifth starter this year, they're going to miss the St. Louis series. They're going to be starting against Kansas city in their first start of the season. And if you're looking for a team that you can take advantage of starting against Kansas city might be good for getting the mindset and the skill set back up there. And Riley, like looking at the projection systems, you say Kikuchi had a 5.19 walk for nine last year. None of the projections have him higher than a 3.92, right? So everyone thinks that that number is going down. And if he keeps his strikeout gains, which he gained last year, then you say Kikuchi, I don't want to say this because this is a hell of a comp, but like he could be Robbie Ray. Like remember before Robbie Ray came into Toronto, he pitched in Arizona. He was walking everybody. Like the stuff was good, but like he was getting his strikeouts, but it's just, he would give up too many home runs and he couldn't get there. And then when he figured it out in Toronto, Robbie Ray won a Cy Young award. Now, it's going to be very, very hard for Yusei Kikuchi to win a Cy Young Award. I am not saying that he's going to, but that is what a successful season is going to look like for Yusei Kikuchi if he can do that. So there's a non-zero chance that happens. Uh, a successful year for, for me, for you, say Kikuchi, um, would be 155, 160 innings pitch, because I do not expect him to, you know, maybe even exceed 180, because mm -hmm. I don't expect a lot of, you know, long starts. I mean, if, hey, if he's rolling, keep him on the hill. Sure. <clears throat> but I think exactly what we both said. Two times through the order, if they start to hit you, I mean, it's time to take him out of the out of the ball game. His leash for me is already short, and in the minds of the coaching staff and John Schneider's head, you gotta watch this kind of stuff. But I mean, yeah, there's a good chance, Jesse, in those starts, if he faces, you know, the order twice, that's 18 batters. I mean, there's a chance, eight or nine strikeouts, maybe ten. There could be mm -hmm. a lot of strikeouts in Absolutely. his game, man. There's a lot of lot of untapped stuff there. I'm and I'm really looking forward to see it, man. And again, same thing with Jose Barrios. Um, Kikuchi's gonna have a lot better of a year this year for sure. And it's showing up he's showing up in the spring and doing his work, and I absolutely love to see it. I don't want to go into our bold takes yet because we are going to do that on next episode after this. But spoiler alert, there might be a Yusei Kikuchi thing coming in that. So stay tuned for that. Riley. You, those two are probably the undoubted big ones, right? You're like Jose Brios and Yusei Kikuchi for going on how well this Toronto Blue Jays team is going to be this year. But there are lots others, specifically on the offensive side of the ball too, that could make or break this Toronto Blue Jays team. So go ahead, give me your first one, Riley. Who's your X factor, preferably on the hitter side? 
Oh, definitely going to be on the hitter side. This is my <laughs> second one anyway. You want to talk about a guy that is coming into Toronto, and if you're a casual a casual listener or a casual viewer of the show, and you want you you love you just love baseball, you want to you want to go out, and I hope this guy stays a long time. You want to go out and buy a Dalton Varsho jersey. Okay, I mean, yeah. this guy is not a household name by any means yet, but this guy is going to be a great addition to this Toronto Blue Jays club. The power in his bat, the speed in the field and on the base paths, and his defensive metrics that are, by the way, outstanding. Oh, as an outfielder, did I mention this guy plays catcher? This is a perfect yes. guy for us to have. I don't even care if he didn't play catcher. I just love to throw that. I don't even know if he'll catch seven innings for us this yeah, year. Maybe I don't even 10. know what the – Like, not many. I don't know. Yeah. If you know the over under, let me know because I'm curious. Sure. But if we stick this guy and, you know, he's probably going to play a corner field but can easily play center field when he would be called upon. I mean, I don't even know where to bat this guy in the order because this is a guy who hit, I think it was 27 home runs last 27. year. 27 yep. home runs. And, and when you hit 27 home runs, runs jesse mm -hmm. i believe that dalton Vars show in this home run season and i believe uh, at least 15 stolen bases too now let's talk about maybe not the elephant in the room but maybe the only hole in his game which would be contact um he's a big swing and a miss kind of guy but for me jesse what compensates for 30 home runs well is a 240 batting average like good if you had 30 home runs well it's not great but, yeah. Jesse, this isn't a guy who's going to lead our team to the promised lands. This guy's a great complementary player, and I think he's the perfect complementary player for this Blue Jays team. Not only being a left-handed bat, um, we might have the best defensive um, outfield in baseball now with Kiermaier and Varsho. I mean, Springer, who was our probably, you know, best all-around defender last year, is now kind of the odd man out with these two defensive wizards out there. And, you know, you put Varsho sixth in the batting order, seventh in the batting order, that can supply that kind of pop, regardless of the batting average. I mean, that's pretty lethal, man. I mean, we have guys one through nine that are a threat at any point in the ball game to go yard. And I think that's going to happen a lot with Dalton Varsho. His big X factor for me is just, yeah, we don't really know what we're going to get with him. Mm -hmm. We kind of know based off his numbers with the Diamondbacks. Now, I'd be, I'd be lying to you if I said that I knew a ton about him because I watch a lot of D-backs games and highlights. <laughs> and look at the numbers, you know, to possibly back it up. And what I see, I, I really do like, I like, you know, he's a four tool guy. He's got the speed. He's got the glove. He's got the arm. He's got the power. Yes. The contact totally isn't there, but this new age in baseball with the long ball and strike out every other at bat, you know, I don't, I don't really hate it. We have a lot of guys who can post good averages. We're trying to fill a spot that was Teoscar Hernandez in a way. And I believe that he can be comped with the amount of home runs that he's going to hit and from the other side of the plate, Jesse, uh, there's green flags all over the place for, for Dalton Varsho, man. I cannot wait for the regular season to see how he starts with the Toronto Blue Jays. So Riley, you made a very good point here about um, what is the upside for Dalton Varsho? Like the power is real. The speed is real. And we know at worst, the defense is going to be incredible. He led baseball and outs above average last year. So we know at a baseline, if he's in the lineup every day and playing defense, like that's going to be valuable. That's going to be there no matter what. Riley, I'm going to talk a little bit about his Diamondback season last year and see if any of this concerns you. Out of the, just give me a quick yes or no if it concerns you at all. Um, out of his 27 home runs, nine of them came, came in September. So he only had 18 home runs going into that month. Does that concern you? Uh, it really doesn't concern. It really doesn't concern me, Jesse. And I like it that it wasn't. I'm glad you said September and not mm -hmm. May. I like that he's kind of riding on that because he's very much still a developing at the major leagues type of guy. Okay. Next question. Out of his 27 home runs he hit, only one of them came off a left-handed pitcher. Does that concern you? I mean, of course, ideally, you would love to hit good from, you know, both uh, hands of pitchers. Uh, as two lefty bats, Jesse, you and I can probably both say we love facing righties. We hate facing lefties. Mm -hmm. I'm sure That's Varsho true. is the same way. But guess what? The guys he has around him in the order that are righty bats can probably mash off the lefties. So, you know what? We'll take it. We'll take what we can get. It doesn't concern me, but it's going to look like it's going to affect his numbers a little bit as far as batting average goes. Okay. And then I guess my last thing is that his 
walk rate went from 10.4% in 2020 to 87 down to 78 And his strikeout percentage rose about three points between 2021 and 2022. Do either of those concern you? Well, of course, that that does concern me, Jesse, but not enough that I think that, you know, I think those numbers can kind of be plateaued and flattened a little bit. I mean, of course, ideally, you would like to see a guy walk a bit more. Um, you know, maybe that's, you know, maybe it's just an off kind of year. We'll Again, we'll see kind of what happens with him. I do expect a lot of strikeouts, and it would be nice for the on-base percentage to be up via the walk. But, mm -hmm. um, man, just excited for that raw power. And, yeah, there's a lot of swing and miss in this game, but going to be an exciting player to watch. So to me, Dalton Varsho kind of strikes me as like a left-handed hitting Matt Chapman, for example. Like Matt Chapman takes a lot of pitches, and then when he runs into it, he'll drive it. But, you know, he swings and misses quite a bit. You know, he will he will take some pitches you really don't want him to take, you know, pitches that you think he should be able to do some damage with. Dalton Varsho is going to do a lot of that. So I think there is potential for Dalton Varsho to go on some extremely cold stretches last year or next year, especially when the home runs aren't popping over, right? He could have a four for 40 stretch. And I don't think it would surprise anyone. And it will come during a time where it was like, well, his defense is really good, but like four for 40, that's yikes. Like you need something better than that in the lineup. So there will be points during the season next year where that does happen for Dalton Varsho. And I'm just, I'm a little concerned about what we're going to get from the bat. But again, at the end of the day, the defense and speed are going to be so good. I don't think it's really going to matter. Right. But I do have a little bit of concern about Darton, Dalton Varsho, especially if he's put up with the pressure of trying to replace Teoscar Hernandez's bat in the lineup. I think that, yeah, he is trying to replace the bat in a way, but they're definitely different players, different makeup of players there. And his defense and speed really does save him a bit. But I do think that, um, that if he has a cold streak, there will be just an inserted hot one, maybe to follow her before. Sure, yeah. And um, like, I, I mean, I know that you said like, you know, the majority of his home runs were hit in September in comparison to the other months. But um, you know, if you really average that out, Jesse, 27 home runs is 27 home runs. That's still a very respectable year. And you know what? When I, when, like I said, when you hit 27, you can hit 30. And when you become a 30 home run player at the major league level, people start to take the, take notice to that. Remember, he's still quite young too, right? His uh, 27 home runs would have been tied for Matt Chapman, which would have been second on the team. So good stuff. And seeing how Tay Oscar only hit 25 last year, maybe there is more to it than we think. It'll be a very interesting player to watch. And that is probably why he is our number one X factor on the offensive side of the baseball for the Toronto Blue Jays. If Dalton Varsho is performing, it's only going to go well. I have another outfielder, Riley, that I want to talk about on the Toronto Blue Jays, who I think could be whose performance on the field this year could really affect if the Toronto Blue Jays are going to say win the AL East or compete in a wild card. And that is George Springer, Riley. And George Springer, we talked about it coming into last year. He's on the wrong side of 30. You know, he was able to stay on the diamond for actually most of the season last year, which I think we thought was kind of surprising after in 2021, he was injured for most of the first half. So it was good, but you started to see some signs down the stretch with George Springer too, where I remember we talked last episode about how he was doing a swing and his hand wasn't coming through completely. He was kind of doing like a one handed follow through on the thing. And Chris black on Twitter, who uh, we tossed a retweet to did a nice deep dive on George Springer about how he was like, he was coming through. He was trying to cheat, I guess, on the fastball a little bit. And we've talked about it before. When a player starts to decline, the first thing that usually goes is catching up to the fastball. Now, George Springer still crushed the fastball last year. I think he hit best against the fastball than any other pitch. But maybe that's because he was cheating for it. And because of that, you saw George Springer really struggle against the changeup last year. So maybe some teams are picking up on that. Now, it could just be a thing, Riley. He wasn't healthy. He had a sore elbow. He talked about at the start of spring how, hey, it's pretty hard to play baseball when your elbow hurts all the time. So maybe now he's fully healthy and he's going to be past that. But there were some red signs and maybe even some signs of decline in George Springer. And I guess the question is, like, I think we both agree his best days are behind him, right? So I think it's all going to come down to how big is the decline? Is it going to be like a 5% drop or is it going to be a 50% drop? And if it is that steep of a decline on offense for George Springer, this team is going to struggle on offense. So what are your thoughts on George Springer in this year? So we can talk about the, let's talk about the, you know, the possible declines. I mean, yes, I believe that there are, the best years for George Springer are, are are behind him. I mean, at one point for the Houston Astros, I believe he had 39 home runs, might be his career high. There was a time where he was definitely stealing double-digit bases. I mean, he still has the possibility to kind of maybe do that double-digit steals. Um, but if you're looking to fill your batting order in the major leagues, whether you're American League or National League, and you search for a leadoff hitter, 
um, as a, you know, a, an offensively minded outfielder. I think nowhere better than George Springer. This guy is probably, if not one of the best leadoff power hitters of all time. Mm -hmm. I was super excited when we first got him. And yeah, we didn't get the George Springer that was going to hit 39 home runs. But what we got was an extremely impactful player. I mean, you looked at the numbers where when he was in the lineup when he first got here versus when he wasn't. Like, George Springer was, was a huge part of this team. He still is a huge part of this team. And I like the fact that there's a good chance he's going to play a lot of corner outfield, get some DH days in, because we need to, as much as use this guy, we need to preserve him when necessary. Age is definitely a factor. How big of a step back is he going to take? That's a very hard question to ask. We will officially know in probably two off seasons when we go back and look at his cards, we can actually judge based off of his stats. But I believe that there is still a guy with, you know, with a 330, 340 on base percentage. There's a guy who can hit 275. There's a guy that can still hit 25 home runs. I believe that all that is still in George Springer. It's going to be a matter of keeping this guy healthy. And I believe using this guy is key to winning ball games, obviously, but preserving him, Jesse, when necessary is, is important. It's a 162 game season. And I mean, we know how well we do with George Springer in the lineup. So, I mean, yeah, there is a Goldilocks zone in there from when, when to use him, when to put him on the bench. Mm -hmm. But of course, Jesse putting him on the bench, he's not doing any, any damage from the bench, but it is still very necessary. And I believe that we probably have the platoon guys to do it as well. And, a leadoff hitter batting, you know, a, a leadoff guy DHing, you know, not unheard of. And I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if that happens quite a few times this year, man. George Springer is a guy who, yeah, is is aging, but he's still going to put up some pretty damn good numbers when you look at an offensive leadoff hitter. Yeah, I, like I honestly, at the end of the day, I think he's going to be okay. There are some things like his walk rate dipped below ten percent for the first time this year. Um, some of his like sweet sweet spot percentage, if you care about that, kind of dipped. But like he's still an exit velocity monster, still ninety second percentile and max exit velocity. Like Springer still hits the ball really hard. And plus, Riley, he had home runs in three straight games in the spring training this season so far. So he looks ready, ready to go, and he looks healthy. So. We'll have to wait and see long season ahead of us, but we kind of need George Springer to reach his offensive potential. If he's going to be, if this blue Jays team is going to want to be serious for winning the AL East this year, Riley, that's four names down. We got a few more names on our list. who really could be X factors for the Toronto blue Jays this year. I want you to give me your next one. Who do you got? I mean, here's a guy who is going to be a superstar in the major leagues. I'm not going to say he's going to be a future hall of famer, but when you start off your career, uh, doing as well as Bo Bichette did. Mm -hmm. And for the last, I said this so many times, but I think it's just incredible that a Blue Jays hitter for two seasons has led the American League in hits. Wow. I know that's such an arbitrary stat, but really, dude, when you talk about the game of baseball from a hitter's standpoint, what are you trying to do? I mean, yeah, you can walk, that's fine, but you're trying to accumulate hits to score runs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Bo Bichette, has had more hits in the American League than a guy who hit 62 home runs. Like, yeah. whatever. That's great. I absolutely love that from Bo Bichette. Let's not even talk defense for a second. Let's look at what could happen. And, I mean, there's a really good chance that Bo Bichette's going to, you know, take off, I hope, the same way he finished his 2022 campaign. That would be immaculate. Bo Bichette is a guy who I can see – you know, hitting 30 home runs sure. or yeah, at, at least dude, at least like his slugging percentage because of extra base hits. This is a guy who's just going to hit the ball and extra base hits are going to be part of his game as well. Doubles, home runs, the odd triple, whatever, man. Boba Shett just finds a way. That's, that's how he does it, man. I know there has been questionable, you know, takes on pitches and swinging out of the zone, but I, it's, uh, you can kind of just suck it up in a way and say it is part of Boba Shed's game. And if he could change that, think of the ball player he could be, but we're, we're dealing with what we got right now. And until we see improvements, we can talk about improvements he's made, but at the end of the day, you could talk about him making a ridiculous swing in the other batter's box. And yeah, that's, that sucks. And it's not fun to look at, but when you back that up with the most hits in the American league for two consecutive years, 
at a premium position shortstop. Now, I know he doesn't play the position extremely well. <laughs> yes, that's but... an understatement. <laughs> I know, but we still have to give huge credit to Bo Bichette because when you're hitting the ball, you're probably you're putting yourself on base, and you if you got runners on, you're driving in runs. Bo Bichette is going to do a lot of that this year, and if we can eliminate the swings and misses or, you know, just the swings in general on some pitches, you know, maybe improve the walk rate just a skosh. You know, I would be super fine with that and even maybe pick away at his defense. Yeah, less throwing errors, uh, uh, you know, on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, so just like we did with Dalton Varshow, before I add my thoughts on Boba Shett, are we going to do the same thing? Riley, are you concerned about any of these things? The first thing, Riley, are you concerned about just that, his defense? Because if you remember in the 2015 season for the Toronto Blue Jays, we had Jose Reyes at shortstop, and Jose Reyes really struggled defensively that season, and the Jays lost a lot of games because of it. It wasn't until we got Troy Tulowitzki in here to play shortstop, play sound defense there, that the Blue Jays really took a step forward. So how big of a concern, I guess, is the defense from Boba Shett? Well, yeah, of course, it's a, a concern, man. If it loses us games, if defense should never lose you games, that's when you really start to hurt is when the defense costs you the games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely concerns me. But until that really does happen, I mean, a throwing error in the ninth inning that costs you a game, obviously the end all be all of errors, the Buckner, so be it, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we definitely don't want to see that. Then we can talk about that. But the potential for it to be that, Jesse, yeah, it's obviously a concern. Uh, and then how about his sprint speed just disappointing? He was 82nd percentile in his rookie year, and that number has dropped now to just 55 percentile last year. Riley, a 24-year-old just getting slower seems weird. Are you, are you concerned about this at all? I mean, a touch concerned about it, though. You, you, I mean, obviously, young, losing speed at this point, but it's not... Um, it's not going to, you know, how to say, project more slow. If he's going to be a slower speed, it's going to remain around this. If he doesn't have the lightning speed he had when he was 22, he's not going to slow down significantly more by the time he's 28. It's kind of going to maybe hold at this point. Maybe the possibility of Bo not stealing 30 bases is is, is gone. I'm fine with that. Um, it, it stinks. Obviously, you want a complete player. You want a complete shortstop and the complete package in Bo Bichette. Probably not going to happen. Concerns me Concerns me a little bit less, though. Okay, yeah. it's For what it's worth, Riley, Boba Shed has been stealing bags this spring. Like He looks like he's determined he's ready to go. The kid has his money now, which maybe is important to him, so now he can play without having to worry about the weight of getting a paycheck at the end of the day. But, Riley, when you look at Boba Shed, especially at the plate, he looks like he's just one small step away from being an absolute superstar, right? Because the contact skills have always been excellent. You don't lead the AL and hit two years in a row by accident. Right. And he is so good at generating his power from his small frame with the way he goes about his legs. And like, there have been uh, rival pitchers who says Boba Shett can just do things like a small flick of the wrist to take an inside pitch and just flare it the other way over to the right field. Derek Jeter was excellent at this. And Boba Shett has a lot of that in his game. Riley, you already kind of touched on it here, but it's the swing decisions need to be better for Boba Shett. He is electric on first pitches of at bats because sometimes pitchers are throwing a get me over strike and you can do damage. So when Boba Shett gets his strikes, he is crushing it. And like, here's a stat that'll prove it. When Boba Shett goes down in the count, 0 and 1. He hits only 215 with a 653 OPS. Riley, when he was up in the count 1 and 0, he hits 354 with a 967 OPS, and it only gets better as it goes on. So, like, just do what you can, right? Bo Bichette, if that first pitch is over the zone, crush it. If it's not, take it because you are statistically going to be a much better hitter if you are getting into hitting counts because Bo Bichette is so good at hitting those pitches when they're over the plate. So I want to see some of that from Bo Bichette this year. And if he starts doing that early this year, he's going to be a monster this season. I mean, you're talking about pretty much almost 300 points in on-base plus slugging. Mm -hmm. That's significant, man. So that being said, with Bo Bichette, like the average, the average is generated from the amount of hits he's going to get. The slugging is going to come from extra base hits. Yeah. So all you're adding on to that is your on base percentage, which Jesse, if there isn't much discretion between his average and his on base, maybe if it's a 35, 40 point difference because of the lack of walks, we're still probably seeing a seven around a 750 OPS, which to me is a huge success for Bo. I mean, which in the number could be much higher. Yeah, I want more. I think I want more than a 750 OPS for Bo this year. I want to see at least mid to low 800s for Bo Bichette this year because he is that talented. Like he can do that. 
I absolutely think that the 800 is, is very possible. Just want to be on the, the downside of it. Again, Jesse, we don't know, you know, with the dimensions of this Rogers Center, this screams perfect uh, Bo Bichette dimensions. We could see a lot of opposite field home runs out of Bo, man. Yeah, and I think it's likely to get onto it as well. Um, Bo Bichette, some Blue Jays fans, he absolutely frustrates, right? I, I like it. I like it too. I just wish he'd turn on that fastball more, but like it's, He's so close to being that complete hitter, right? And you just want to see it. If he can unlock it and get something to click this year, Bo Bichette could be a monster. But Riley, I want to move on to another guy who could be a monster, a guy we've already seen be a monster. And I don't really have anything more to add on this, but that is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And we talked about it a bit last year, growing through the course of the season, that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. in 2021 was the MVP level guy. He was carrying this team. The Blue Jays were the best offense in baseball in 2021. And Vladimir Guerrero Jr. having an MVP season went a long way to doing that. Last year, the Jays were top five in baseball, but they weren't the best because Vladimir Guerrero Jr., frankly, wasn't at his best. And I do want to say, if we're talking X factors here, right? Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is good. He's going to be good. We all know that, right? Launch angle is up this spring. We love seeing that. He was hitting home runs before he went out of spring with a knee inflammation. But I want to touch on that too, because Vladdy has only missed three games in the last three seasons. Now, two of them I was at, which is kind of very funny, but a story for another day. Um, Law of average just, just says, like, this guy is going to get hurt in his career eventually, right? Like, no player. Very, very few players stay healthy for their whole entire part of his career. So Vlad is going to get hurt at some point. And if he gets hurt for an extended period of time, which he already is hurt this spring too. So that seems kind of bad. Like the blue Jays aren't going to be that much of an offensive juggernaut unless Vladimir Guerrero jr. Is healthy and there and productive in part of the middle of the lineup. So that's really all I got is just stay healthy, Vladdy, please. Cause if you don't, this team could falter. Well, and Jesse, that's why he pulled himself from he pulled himself from the World yes. Baseball Classic. He won't participate much more in this spring. But Jesse, this guy is an offensive juggernaut. Mm. This is a 40 plus home run guy. This is a hundred RBIs. This is over 110 runs scored kind of guy. Vladimir Guerrero Jr., you've said it, is going to take this team to the promised lands, potentially, allegedly. Um, he has he's has the play to back it up. And now to add on, not that it really means anything nowadays, but he's got a gold glove at the position of first base. I just think that's cool. He mashed a million home runs in that one home run derby and yes, still lost in Colorado. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I mean, geez, man, like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is the one player in the league. That a lot of teams, I know they wish had him. You could have an Aaron Judge, but the age is not really on his side. The, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is a guy who is a weapon. I mean, if you were to have a zombie apocalypse with a bunch of zombies, with a guy who can just swing the bat and hit things hard, Vladdy's a monster. 100%. He's a killer. Yes. Like we watch a murder baseballs. I mean, his egg. Um, average exit velocity has got to be one of the top the problem is jesse yes we've brought to, to your attention many times on this program but is it going to be a hard ground ball out mm -hmm. or is it going to be a screaming double off the ball or better yet a home run because we've seen a, that a ton now yes adjustments before the injury took place we did kind of touch on that yes the, the exit velocity, velocity was up, and so was the launch angle. So those are good takeaways. Now, it does suck that he is taking time off to recoup from an injury, but it is well needed because Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is someone who needs to rest now because he needs to play on the big stage. We need him help, healthy for opening day, the opening series, the opening month, and the rest of the year because if Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is on, he's going to have another top three um, votes an MVP again. He took a year off last year. He decided to take take a little off, you Don't know, a that, little Vladdy. bit of a come slump, on. but it come back hard. He's he's coming back, and I mean, we need him because he's going to win us a lot of ball games. He's going to hit a lot of home runs. Going to drive in a ton of runs. He's going to walk a lot. I mean, obviously, it's a huge uh, less swing and miss. He does swing the bat really hard and it can result into some, you know, his, his body basically shifting hard and the, mm -hmm. and the ball ending up in the catcher's mitt. But that's part of his game, man, because if it connected, it was going 113 miles an hour into the left field stands. But Jesse, just an exciting guy to watch. I mean, obviously, a lot of eyes on his career, his father being in the Baseball Hall of Fame, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. having the comps um, to 
you know, potentially be a future Cooperstown member. I mean, with this guy, I know he's got a long career ahead of him, but he has all the makings and we've seen it as Blue Jays fans, as guys that analyze the games. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is the guy you want and the guy that is going to take the Blue Jays to a championship potentially. Yeah, we're running shorter on time here, so we're going to get through these next guys really quickly. But the next, like, those are the big main guys, right? The Blue Jays are going to go as far, I think, as those five players that we have mentioned take this team. But I want to touch on some of the other, especially higher-end players on this roster. And I want to talk about Alec Manoa, Riley. And now, you and I both think, you said last episode that Alec Manoa is going to win a Cy Young Award next year. And that's a smart bet, right? No one's going to give you flack for thinking Alec Manoa is going to be a Cy Young Award winner next year. He was awesome. He finished third, right? Soft contact machine. He seemed to get better as the season gone on, you know, but I've been thinking a lot about Alec Manoa lately and why the projection systems are so bad on Alec Manoa, why they think he's going to be a four ERA guy. Now you and me both don't think that's possible. We asked our fans, none of them think that's going to happen either, but I do think there is maybe some regression coming for Alec Manoa next year. Like maybe he's going to be a mid threes ERA guy for what it's worth to Riley. Alec Manoa has not looked that good in spring, right? He's been missing arm side. Now, again, through a lot of innings last year, it's very early. It seems to be just a quick mechanical thing. If anyone's going to figure it out, Alec Manoa is going to figure it out. But like, if he's not good and say he is just a mid threes ERA guy, which is, is still a good pitcher, but it's not the like low twos guy he was last year, right? And if we lose more of Alec Manoa starts and we win, then the Jays might be in trouble next year. And, you know, I don't think the odds are high on that happening from Alec Manoa next year, but there is a chance, right? And that's what could really sink this team is if we got a poor performance from Alec Manoa this year. So Riley, tell me I'm stupid for doubting Alec Manoa like this. You're not stupid. I mean, I I wouldn't be blown away. I wouldn't be taken the, the year wouldn't be taken from my <clears throat> from my breath from my lungs if he finished with a 3.10 ERA. Um I would be very surprised to see, you know, 10 losses attached to his starts, especially with the offense we have cuz uh, you know he's going to get a lot of run support, but you know that Alec Manoa is going to p- pitch deep into ball games and I think it it goes again He's not going to have a short leash. Um, there was times where, yeah, he possibly ha- could have had and probably should have had complete games um, for the safe bet. We we took him out of the out of the ball game, and that's fine. But maybe the runs come later in ball games. But this is a guy who's going to flash early and often. I mean, he's got just a filthy pitch mix, and yeah, the soft contact all over the place. And just a fun guy, electric guy to watch. If you want to say that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is the future on the offensive side for the bats, Alec Manoa is the guy from the pitching standpoint that is going to do a ton. I wouldn't be surprised. I know, again, wins such an arbitrary stat, but man, would 20 wins ever look good on his baseball card? And I think he could for sure do that. Um, he's going to pitch. I, I think he's going to pitch over 200, 200 innings this year, 175 wow. to wow. 185 Ks. Like I, like I think Manoa is going to be absolutely fantastic this year, man. I'm really on the Cy Young train for Alec Manoa. You know what? You're probably right. Honestly, like if you were a betting man, you'd bet probably he takes another jump forward then another step back, but I don't want to rule it out because it could happen. You know, progression isn't always linear, but maybe Alec Manoa is just built different, right? Which we can't rule out. Another guy, Riley, who's been good, who's kind of on the same thought of Alec Manoa is like, if you think about how the Toronto Blue Jays could struggle and they could disappoint this year, one way they could do it is to not get consistent pitching out of the ninth inning. And that would be if Jordan Romano has a down year. Now look, Riley, Jordan Romano was amazing last year. He had more one run saves than any other pitcher in baseball. He was downright filthy. You look at the stuff, right? hundred mile per hour fastball, a wipeout slider. He's got the best stuff in the bullpen, right? So there's no signs that point that say Jordan Romano was going to struggle more this year, but you know, there is a chance. Maybe he doesn't get so lucky. Maybe, you know, the Babbitt gods that hurt Barrios and hurt Gosman this year come for Jordan Romano. And maybe those one run saves we're having in the ninth now are turning into blown saves. And maybe we lose these games in extras. And that might not be because Jordan Romano's pitching bad. He might just be getting unlucky. But if the Blue Jays are going to win, you know, they have to keep these leads that they are getting, right? We've seen throughout the playoffs and stuff like bullpen leads happen and you know, it's devastating. Those losses always seem to hurt more too. Like if you need a win to stop a winning streak and you are winning in the ninth and then your closer blows a game, or if you are like um, on a big losing streak and you take a lead and then your closer blows it, those ones just hurt so much more. And look, I think Jordan Romano is going to be good. I bet you think Jordan Romano is going to be good again, but like 
that is still an X factor. We still have to check in on this early in the year and make sure Jordan Romano is still good. I mean, Jordan Romano, I think, had a career year. I don't see it as a step back. Relief pitchers are some of the they can have some of the craziest variations and statistics all over the board. If all of a sudden he goes into two ball games in the first, uh, you know, two weeks, first week of the year, and one run leads and two has two blown saves, it could look really wacky. Th- those numbers on his earned run on his on his whip could look really wacky for the next month and a half based off the amount of innings. But hey. Let me tell you something. Baseball, through and through, if you're a closer who's right-handed and your name isn't Mariano Rivera and you don't have a wicked cutter, probably the best pitch ever, sure. you're going to be a hard thrower like Jordan Romano. And he's a man, did he ever burn guys with his heat? This is a guy that you don't think throws, you know, almost 100 miles an hour, but he does. And he was damn good at locating that fastball. And a perfect closer, in my opinion, I absolutely think that Jordan Romano is going to have a great year. Do I know how many saves he's going to get or is ERA finishing whatever? No, I have no idea. I hate predicting clo- like relief pitchers, let alone closer stats. One of the hardest things yeah, to project is, yeah. is saves. I mean, but I'll tell you one thing, though, is my comfort level, and I'm sure a lot of people's comfort level feels pretty good when Jordan Romano does come into a ball game. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'd be lying to you if I said that there wasn't going to be blown saves. That will happen. But how often, you know, what kind of, is he going to start an inning fresh or is he going to be inserted into a ball game? You know, what's his delivery going to be like based off the new kind of, you know, whatever they call a Bach and changing things around. I don't know if he's really affected by it too much. I know Kevin Gosman is, but I think that there might be some adjustments to still be made in Jordan Romano's game. But I do know one thing's for sure, Jesse, is that he will be our so-called closer whether that means coming in to the bottom of the ninth or the top of the ninth with a three-run lead or less, I feel confident whether it's one run or three runs. And the fact that he did have the most one out or one run lead saves in baseball just makes me feel that much better about Jordan Romano still being our closer for this season. Yeah, he, like he's going to be the closer without a doubt. He's going to be good. I think everyone thinks he's going to be good, but just keep an eye on this. Riley, I, we don't really have time to dive in deep into any of these other guys, but I wanted to say quickly about Alejandro Kirk. Really good for two months of the year, kind of just league average or poor for other four months of the year. So keep an eye on that. Also 14 home runs, kind of low for Alejandro Kirk. And then some of our other guys like Brandon Belt, Matt Chapman, and then Danny Jansen. And like, what about the young kids, Addison Barger or Ricky Tiedemann? Like these guys are all going to play important roles on this team this year. Do you have anything about those guys you want to mention here quickly? Yeah, just quickly, definitely one that was on my mind. We talked before the show. I don't think Danny Jansen gets enough love. Um, I love that he's a Toronto Blue Jay. I'm still surprised he's a Blue Jay for the amount we could have got to this guy. He's never played a full season at the major league level, which is incredible. You look at his stats around the board, because if this guy were to play 135, 140 games, his his statistics as a, as a power hitting catcher would look absolutely phenomenal. Still in the plus side, as far as defensive metrics goes, we just happen to have a guy named Alejandro Kirk that was an all-star last year. You might've mm-hmm. heard of him. Um, and instead we got, you know, two of the top 10 catchers. So MLB has Kirk and Jansen both in the top 10. I think that's incredible. And they How should. often that they happens should. where, you're the yeah, it's well deserved though yeah. i mean jansen has just incredible power and is like i said his defensive metrics are still great i love to give danny jansen love i don't think he deserves i don't think he gets enough love i agree and like matt chapman you know brandon belt i think we know what those guys are we've talked about those guys lots on other episodes in terms of the prospect um addison barger and ricky tiedemann you know tiedemann was just one of the guys sent down to minor league camp we talked a lot about ricky tiedemann and what the plan is for him going forward so go back to one of our episodes and listen to that if you want to hear about that um riley Otto Lopez looked good for Team Canada. In fact, he had a big three-run home run today, and he was impressing the Blue Jays in camp. And Addison Barger actually went 22 for 22 on pitches in the zone that he swung at without missing. The only other player who did that this spring was Jeff McNeil, and he just won a batting title with the Mets. So that is impressive for the Toronto Blue Jays here. So I guess I'm going to ask you, Riley, who is winning that last spot on the roster? Or do they go like a defensive guy like Nathan Lucas or something like that? Who is it going to be? I think – and. I want to first off, thank you for bringing up the Otto Lopez thing, because I think that's amazing. And I said before the show, 
I don't think it's going to be Otto Lopez, but he's going to be an awesome platoon type guy in the future. I really think it's going to be Barger, dude. I think there's there should be no question in in the staff's mind that this is the this is the guy that's got to be the final player added to the roster. I think he's had an incredible spring. Yeah. And yes, he is very much still developing, but from what I've seen so far, he can he can handle it, man. He can hack it. And I am a f- I whether he whether he starts at, at the major league level or not, he will do fine wherever he is. Obviously, he will receive less time at the major league level, but I think that's really good experience to have. And even if it is just a cup of coffee, give him that drink because man, this boy's been eaten in the spring and he's thirsty. He needs a cup of coffee to go with, you know, the feasting he's had so far in the spring training. Yeah, I think he's going to be quite good, honestly. And either one who gets it, like both have impressed me. Both are going to see time on the big league roster this year. So I guess it really doesn't matter who the 26th man is. Like, Gosuke Kato was the 20, 26th man on uh, last year's opening day roster. So we'll see from that. Riley, I've got a little more news and notes here. The Blue Jays did send down a bunch of guys from spring training to their minor league camp. We already mentioned Ricky Tiedemann. Other notable names that have been sent down to minor league camp or Elvis Martinez, Spencer Horowitz, who's over with Team Israel right now playing in uh, the World Baseball Classic, Leo Jimenez, Yaz Razuleta. Some of our top names, Hayden Junger and um, Sam Robarisi, are all names. I don't think we expected any of them to make the team out of camp anyway so i don't think any of this is surprising here um and then we had some injury updates brandon belt and alejandro kirk are both back with the team back in spring both seem all systems go ready for spring training and for opening day and i have two new injury updates riley the first one is uh mitch white through a side session yesterday. So the next step is likely to get into game action later this week. And John Schneider said, quote, he's right where he should be. No red flags on the recovery from Mitch White. So he should be stretched out and ready to go in time for the season. And then Hunjin Ryu, Riley, he's been doing some training, including some long toss and is targeting bullpen sessions come April. Still on track for a midseason return for Hunjin Ryu. So Riley, any of those things catch your attention? Yeah, of course. The Hunjin Ryu thing. I don't talk, haven't talked about him. So I'll just take that as my takeaway right now. Um, yeah, I wish we could have got him back sooner because I often forget that he is a part of this pitching staff. And is he the missing part? Is he going to, you know, maybe are we going to struggle first half, Jesse? And are we going to see Hunjin Ryu come in and possibly save this team? Is Hunjin Ryu a bruised X factor right now? Does he wind it back and give us those glory Dodger days? I mean, what are we going to get from Hunjin Ryu? As I thought, you know, when we first got him, I thought the contract was a little bit silly. Um, and it hasn't paid off just quite yet because he's still got more term. And if he comes back, we're definitely going to use him. If he it can be a piece in this puzzle, we call a ball club, then we will absolutely benefit from having him on our rotation. I guess it makes sense. We're talking about X factors for the Toronto Blue Jays this year. And I guess Hunjin Ryu is indeed just that an X factor. Like if he's good, which I don't think he's going to be, he was bad last year. He was bad the year before he was bad before his injury coming in, but there is still a chance. He just figures it out. Maybe the time off the mental reset can get Hunjin Ryu back to where he needs to be. So we will wait and see um, Riley. That's really all we've got. We spent a lot of time breaking down these players, but I think it's important, right? We are into season preview mode here. So the performance of these players is going to go down to how well we think the Toronto Blue Jays team are going to do this year. And it's going to be something that we're going to look back on to as the season goes on, right? To kind of compare it to this baseline we set for all these players. So I guess final saying here, do you have one major takeaway or one player that we really think needs to take a step forward this year? Yes. Easy question. It was the first player I talked about. Jose Barrios really needs to take a step forward. He needs to step up, live up to the dollar attached to his contract right now, and really, really set the tone. He's pitch will be pitching out of the four spot in the rotation, but we really need Jose Barrios to be on this year for us to be a successful and winning ball club. Yeah, and I agree. And uh, that's definitely the main one, but I do want to point out guys like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Dalton Varsho, or not Dalton Varsho, well, him too, but also Bo Bichette really need to take their step forwards. Uh, guys, that'll do it for our episode here today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We are sorry about the delay. You know, Riley and I are adults. We're excited about baseball too. We had stuff going on, but hey, we're here. We're still going to try to come back with two more episodes before the start of the regular season. We have our bold predictions episode coming next. So if you guys at home have a bold prediction and you want to talk to us about it, you can reach out to us on any of our 
social channels, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We're going to be everywhere, man. Tweet us there on your bold prediction for the Toronto Blue Jays this year. Riley and I love doing this one. We've got some good ones in store for this week's episode. And then the week after that, we've got our official Blue Jays spring training. And then just like that, we're into games where you and I will be doing, we're going to try to do this at least after every series, two times a week to get it done and really dissect this Toronto Blue Jays team. If you were with us last year, it's going to be more of the same, if not bigger or better this year. Riley, anything else to add before we call our day here today? No, X Factors is always a fun one to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of different guys to look at with this roster. Same core guys, but I love the pieces we've added. Just want to be real quick. We didn't mention his name once. I had him as well. Chris Bassett going to be another good pitcher for us this year. That's fine. Hey, there's a lot of players and only a certain amount of time to do this, Jesse. Pitching is going to win you games. And I mean, we've, we've got guys that can do it and we're waiting to see how the other few can do run support's going to be big. We're going to score a lot of runs this year, Jesse. I'm sure that. Can't wait. We are less than just over two weeks away for opening day now. So it's coming. It'll be here before you know it. it is officially baseball season, Riley. And I couldn't be more excited until then guys. We'll see you later this week. Thanks guys.